I'm going to read uh, a little bit from the beginning of this book, The Last Flight of Coxal West. It's uh, told in two voices. The first is a teenager in Boston in the 1980s. His name's Eli Goldstein. He tells the story of the reception of a memoir that's been written by his nominal uncle, Coxal West. Uh, and Coxal's memoir takes up the rest of the book. I'm going to read just from the beginning of the Eli section. My students, whenever I teach, always ask what they should read, and I say, just read the beginning. I'm going to just read the beginning. Uh, so this part is called Acknowledgement Prologue. Can you hear me? Before halftime on Super Bowl Sunday, January 1986, my Uncle Coxel came over. He was just months from reaching the height of his fame and unaware the game was being played. He wasn't technically my uncle either. He was an old friend of the family. For years, he had taught at a prep school in Cambridge where my grandfather had served as a dean. After a massive heart attack a year after I was born, left my grandfather as much a memory to me as thin morning fog, Uncle Poxel came to fill the void. That Sunday, he sat down in the living room and speaking over the game's play-by-play, -play, started a story he could barely clap his gloves free of snow fast enough to tell. A miracle had occurred that afternoon. His neighbor had died a few months back, and though my Uncle Poxel was consumed with the details of the upcoming publication of his first book, he devised the neighbor's sons in the handling of the estate. The neighbor was an obscure literary novelist who'd enjoyed acclaim early, and then none. Their father had left nothing more than his immense library and thousands of dollars of debt from a mortgage on a house too far in arrears to sell. Uncle Poxel had become immoderately involved in figuring a way to help them, though it wasn't clear what expertise they felt he could lend. Decades ago, he'd quit a job at British Airways to take a PhD in English literature, and later dropped his dissertation on Elizabethan drama to finish what would in time become a successful memoir of his time flying Lancaster bombers for the Royal Air Force. Maybe they assumed that because he had owned a number of houses and apartments, he had a certain familiarity with ownership. Maybe people just assumed from listening to his confident tone that my Uncle Poxel knew what he was talking about. He was falling behind in grading for his classes, and in the early spring he would hit the road for his book tour, but something hadn't let him give up this neighbor's case. And today, Uncle Poxel said, as Steve Grogan missed a receiver with a pass, the deus ex machina. I had no idea what he meant at the time. I was barely 15, and what mattered back then were the Patriots and the Red Sox. Some girl named Rachel Rosti and I was after in my Hebrew class, who couldn't have cared for some, who couldn't have cared less for some wizened <coughs> British war hero. But that Sunday, I was too drawn in by his unerring voice, its dry gravity and utter self-belief, not to find out what happened to his neighbor's sons. Somehow his voice had found the only register that could drown out the game's clamorous announcers. Willie, the younger son, asked me if I'd help pack, Uncle Poxel said. He figured he'd give the books away. Poxel had noted my eyes on him now, not just my parents. The volume of his wry voice rose <coughs> perceptibly. We were a dozen books in when I dropped Sal Bellows Herzog. I picked it up, and a crisp hundred fluttered to the ground. Willie looked at it like it was, well, like it was a rabbi on a football field. He looked at me. The Bears scored. I missed the play and the replay. <laughs> Jillian had used $100 bills as bookmarks in every one of his books. He got paid $200 a review and put half back into the books. They hadn't counted it yet, but there must have been near to $100,000 in his books. He didn't write a review every week, but he wrote for that paper regularly and for others. Maybe he thought his sons would find it all. Willie doubted it, though, and I did too. We were a pile of cardboard boxes away from handing his estate to the Harvard Coop. <laughs> Uncle Poxel kept talking, hauled along by the wonder of the thing. I'd rarely seen him so animated. This was the first time we'd spent alone with him since he'd finalized copy edits on his memoir, and his appearance at our house was a surprise, given the frigid air and snow outside. We'd assumed we wouldn't see him again until his first reading here in Boston, scheduled for the week after the book's publication date. I've been longing to see him, my eccentric European uncle who'd lived so much life. But now the Patriots were in the Super Bowl for the first time, and my tongue buzzed like it did after I woke from a nap. My mother changed the subject, and by then I'd stopped caring about the game. Would the contents of a book ever carry the same meaning again? This image of hundred-dollar bills spilling out of the pages of books would plague me for years. I tried to watch the end of the football game, but Grogan was awful, and a 300-pound Bears lineman known as the refrigerator scored a touchdown. And I couldn't set my mind to anything but my Uncle Poxel, and when I'd finally get to read his stories between bound pages. As I say, my Uncle Poxel would reach the apex of his own literary success in the months ahead after his book finally made its way into the world. Every season, for as long as I could remember, Uncle Poxel had taken me to the opera, the symphony, to the Wang Center to see plays and musicals. If there was a performance of Shakespeare anywhere in our city, Poxel would find a way to take me. 
This wasn't the kind of thing that should have interested me. A trip to Fenway was my idea of a cultural outing. But my Uncle Poxel was built like a power forward, and he moved fluidly as a Bruin, and he was everything the other Jewish authority figures in my life were not. On Monday and Wednesday afternoons, I suffered two hours of Hebrew school, where aging teachers would ply us with tales of woe, melancholy stories of the survivors of death camps and ghettoization. I remember seeing for the first time when I was only 10 the black numbers tattooed on a classmate's grandmother's wrist. I can see even now my young brain being tattooed with pensive fear. My grandfather had survived that period and reached the States only to die before I'd gotten to know him. It compounded my sense then that history was someone trampled force acting upon us, leveling any hope of heroism like some insuperable glacier flattening mountains to plains. Even the new young rabbi at our synagogue, Rabbi Ben Shine, who had come straight from Berkeley with a nappy beard and hair past his shoulders, calling us dude and trying to get us to talk Jewish mysticism sat nodding solemnly as these stories were recited, his fingertips tracing his copy of Night. I recognize now, of course, why we were being inundated with these truths, but I was 15 and what I needed was a hero and hope. We might be able to see God's body in the Kabbalah's ten sefi rope, but it was 1986, barely 40 years since our grandparents' generation sat desperate and faded in their East European neighborhoods. Never again are teachers encanted to us Monday after Monday, Wednesday after Wednesday, but when I picture myself in those rooms in the basement of our shul, even now, I can only hear the incantations reciprocal. It will happen again. Aware. Be always aware. But I was going to see myself as an exception then, too, for I was learning on those outings with Poxel West that I had an antidote in my own family. There was more thunder in my Uncle Poxel's senescent face than in one strand of Rabbi Ben's unkempt mane. Trailing him like the sweet whiff of cherry tobacco from a pipe smoker's coat was the fact that he'd been a pilot for the Royal Air Force, a Jewish war hero, the only one I'd ever heard of. I would have followed his broad shoulders into the ballet without embarrassment. Though his teaching job held a certain prestige, Uncle Poxel was an aspiring writer when we started on our trips. It was all he'd wanted in his later years, to get down stories based on recollections of his youth and all he did with his free time. But in more than a decade, three novels had been rejected by New York editors. No matter how proud he was, his shoulders slumped a bit farther forward with each turning away. Regardless, my parents felt it an inherent good that Uncle Poxel serve as my monthly Virgil to the vague cultural life of downtown Boston. No accrual of rejections in New York could undo cultural currency in our small city, and any time spent with Poxel would do me good, they said. What I learned from my Uncle Poxel in those outings didn't come as we listened to Daniel Barenbaum play the Moonlight Sonata. After each event, Uncle Poxel would drive us out to Newtonville, where over Sundays at Cabot's he would read passages to me from his latest project. This one not a novel, but a memoir. After his return from a trip to London for the funeral of a captain he'd served alongside in the RAF, he finally decided he would write a memoir of his life during that time. He felt more comfortable writing fiction, but if it was a memoir the world needed, he'd write it. It wasn't much different from the novels we'd read from in the past. This new book felt overwrought at times, a feeling I wasn't too young to pick up on. With this new project, suddenly the scenes he'd written were vibrant, absent the hesitations and wanderings of his earlier work. Even today, I feel a pride that borders on embarrassment, intuiting that those scenes were crafted to make my younger self accept them. This next section, Uncle Poxel said one night, after four long hours of Don Giovanni, is the most gripping scene of all when the reader sees what we were really up against, the story of when S. Sugar Bomber went down in a lightning storm. His hands flew up near his curly auburn hair. Uncle Poxel had one of those pointy red Ashkenazi faces whose very shape carries confidence and import. The bridge of his nose was so thin it simply faded into his high red brow. Atop his head he wore a trademark pork pie hat, the brown felt of which was always brushed. The hat's name wasn't lost on him. It's the closest to anything Trafe I ever come, he said. <laughs> Out from the hat's side stuck shocks of his remaining translucent hair, which took light like a polished garnet. Lambic crimson ran to his cheeks through gossamer veins, but there was nothing varicose about my Uncle Poxel's face. He was hale and lissome, a man of indeterminate age, but whose virility was discernible in the very color of his cheeks. He wore a black tweed Brooks Brothers suit with narrow lapels and a collar he popped against the Boston winter. He saw no need to smooth it down now that we were inside spooning cravings and cream. My squadron flew into a thundercloud over Lubeck, he said. That's when S. Sugar began to fly into the thundercloud. Two, crack, boom, blue lightning. I've never seen anything like it. I asked him to read it to me instead of telling me about it. He'd written it down after all, and I wanted to hear. So he put his face to the loose pages before him, and he read. The world around us dropped away as I listened to my Uncle Poxel read from his book. His hands spun dense nimbus clouds in the air between us as he narrated the bomber's bravery. This was an entirely different war story than the ones we read at Hebrew school. Not a story of survival, but of action. It was as if he was crafting his great account before my very eyes, and I don't know that I've been so close 
to history since. My Uncle Paxo was born in a small city north of Prague, but he had a diplomat's accent. His cars had ours as parks too, and unlike the living survivors we met or whose books we read in Hebrew school, his tongue wasn't thick and muddy with Slavic consonants. As he described in the middle chapters of his book, he had been sent to London by way of Rotterdam. By the time the Luftwaffe began bombing the East End, he was enlisted as a squaddy. Paxel was a Jew who had flown for the Royal Air Force during the war and lived to write about it. Though he carried in his broad shoulders the complicated burden of his own actions in those days, he had wrested his fate from the inevitable bearing down of history upon his fellow Ashkenazi Jews. And not only that, but he lived to write about it. I'm going to stop there. Thank you.